if we look to the answer as to why for so many years we achieved so much, prospered as no other people on earth, it was because here in this land we unleashed the energy and individual genius of man to a greater extent than has ever been done before. Freedom and the dignity of the individual have been more available and assured here than in any other place on earth. The price for this freedom at times has been high, but we have never been unwilling to pay that price. Those who say that we're in a time when there are no heroes, they just don't know where to look. You can see heroes every day going in and out of factory gates. You meet heroes across a counter, and they're on both sides of that counter. There are entrepreneurs with faith in themselves and faith in an idea who create new jobs, new wealth, and opportunity. There are individuals and families whose voluntary gifts support church, charity, culture, art, and education. Their patriotism is quiet but deep. Their values sustain our national life. We must realize that no arsenal or no weapon in the arsenals of the world is so formidable as the will and moral courage of free men and women. We are a nation under God, and I believe God intended for us to be free. The crisis we're facing today does not require of us the kind of sacrifice so many thousands of others were called upon to make. It does require, however, our best effort and our willingness to believe in ourselves and to believe in our capacity to perform great deeds, to believe that together, with God's help, we can and will resolve the problems which now confront us. And after all, why shouldn't we believe that? We are Americans.
Welcome to our Sunday morning service. We're continuing our series titled Conduct in the Church through uh, 1 Corinthians, the letter that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. And um, we've been dealing with chapters 5 and 6, which uh, are very difficult to preach on because they are matters of sexual immorality that are prevalent in Paul's day and, and certainly prevalent in our day as well. But they're needful because uh, this sin, in its many forms, uh, really undermines the authority of the local church. Because when Christians commit uh, sexual immorality, they are actually denying the authority that God has over them. And so, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 uh, particularly the latter half of the chapter, verses 12 through 20, deals particularly with that subject. Now when we started in on chapter 5, we began with the Corinthian church tolerating or maybe even condoning sexual immorality in the form of the man who committed incest. And so he was within the membership of the church, but he shouldn't have been. It didn't lead to his removal that he was embroiled in the sin. Uh, it didn't fill the church with grief. The church simply didn't have the ability to be that discerning. And so they didn't understand that if they had followed through with the man's removal, if they had spiritual discernment, it would have been better for the church and it would have been better for that man. It would have led to his chastening and his purity. It would have led to the old leaven being cleaned out of the church and then the church could have been a new batch, as he says here, honoring Christ as an unleavened church should, uh, that is, with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And so those who claim to be brothers or, or sisters in Christ, but they remain sexually immoral, or, or they remain sinful in any area, really, but particularly this sin in chapters 5 and 6, uh, but he does mention greed and idolatry and being verbally abusive and drunkards and swindlers and all of these things. Uh, although those things could be connected with sexual immorality as well. They're behaving as unsaved people that are around them when they give in to these sins or they condone them or they don't do anything about them within their local churches. And so that idea of behaving as unsaved people behave, that's the problem. Because we know that those sins are going to lead people to hell. Such evil people need to be removed from the church, he says. We don't judge outsiders, he says, at least not yet. Uh, but we ought to rightly judge insiders. There is a time when we're going to judge outsiders. It tells us in 1 Corinthians 5 that we will judge both the world and angels. Therefore, we are certainly able to judge trivial temporal matters as we come into chapter 6, like the problems that brothers are having with one another and their conflicts end up being settled by civil magistrates when they should be settled in-house. And so the matters of this present darkness, those temporal matters, we should have the discernment to handle those things if we're going to judge the world and judge angels. And so the problem is we, we take our conflicts to the world of unbelievers. That's what the Corinthian church did. And, and we hope for some sort of worldly resolution. We want things to be settled the same way that they're settled in the world. But when we do these things, it's a defeat for us. It would be better for us to be wronged or to be cheated than to uh, give in to this avenue of thought. Um, when we return such activity... Uh, in kind and wrong and cheat the people that are around us, that's the real trouble uh, because we are really opening up the name of Christ uh, for it to be blasphemed. We don't see the person and work of Christ transforming us and the church is not the light that it should be. The unrighteous do not inherit the kingdom of God, but we do. And so we need to act like it. The world continues to sin with impunity. Why do we expect anything less from the world? The world does what it does. And so 
when it comes to us, we shouldn't participate with them. And the reason why we shouldn't participate with them is that we are in Christ crucified. It's because of the gospel, right? And that's where we left last week. We, we talked about how we were washed, we were sanctified, we were justified in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, his name, by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of our God and Father, the text tells us. And so now when we turn the page and, and we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 through 20, Paul really digs in on this issue of sexual immorality in the church and, and, he, and, and he really gets to the heart of matters when he starts to open up this idea of worldview. Greek wisdom and, and worldview dominated the Corinthian church and that was the whole problem. That had been their problem all along. It's why they had their factions. It's why they were enamored with the wisdom of the philosophers of that ancient city. And so it adversely affects them. The classical Greek understanding of dualism undermined what the Bible had to say. It undermined the authority of God, so they didn't listen. Believers struggled with dividing the body from the spirit. And, and, and that led down two different roads that really are a problem even to this day. And so you have Christians in the past and even Christians today who struggle with certain sins and they think it's all a result of some kind of uh, a physical thing that's going on within them and that they have no control over it. And so they give in to sin and to temptation and so when that happens they feel like they have to punish their body in some way. Or even in the past, you've had generations of Christians who would have deformed their bodies uh, because of the fact that they were giving in to temptations that led to sexual immorality. And then there are other believers who err by just concluding that, well, since the body does what it does, I'm just going to let it do what it does, <laughs> right? And uh, the idea is, you know, I know that this physical body is going to be destroyed one day, so I might, might as well live it up right now. And so certainly one viewpoint leads to hermits and monks and nuns and priests. But the other worldview leads to sexual immorality rampant within the church. And so that brings us to verse 12 then of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Here we read, All things are lawful for me, but, not all, thi but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Food for the stomach and the stomach for foods. But God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. I don't know what's happening in verses 12 and 13 exactly because, you know, we don't have punctuation in the original and we don't know how things are set off in quotes, and we don't know if Paul is maybe quoting a slogan of the Corinthians and then responding to it in, in his dialogue here. I, I tend to think that that's the way it is, though. In other words, the Corinthians are living a life where they're saying, all things are lawful uh, for me. Everything is permitted for me. And then Paul comes back at them with a contrasting statement and says, yes, but all things are not helpful. Okay, I've had conversations like that with other believers who talk about their liberty in Christ and, 
and I have to come back and try to regulate things and say to them, but you know, <laughs> uh, all things are not beneficial to the body of Christ. So all things are, are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any, he says. Foods for the stomach and, and the stomach for foods. I, I wonder if that is a Corinthian statement as well. Kind of parallels what we see at the beginning of verse 12. And then God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality. There's the contrasting statement, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And so I think that Paul is presenting these contrasting views. Two major contrasts to begin the passage and then a third theological contrast to give us the real message of the passage. The contrast maintained that, that, that all things are lawful for us. Everything is permitted by us, but Paul is saying, no, there, there, there are things that are not helpful for you. The food, it's for the stomach, and the stomach is for the food, and, and all that will be done away with one day. And Paul is saying, look, you can't be mastered by anything. And then the spiritual contrast in verse 13, the body of the believer is not for sexual immorality, but it's for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And so the Corinthians had concluded that sexual immorality is not really a problem for us because our physical body will be destroyed one day. And they get that kind of thinking from the world around them, not from God's word. What really mattered to them uh, was that we are spiritual beings. And so for them, they, they had this bifurcation going on where there was this spiritual idea of who I am and this physical idea of who I am and the physical is going to die and molder in the grave one day and the spiritual nature of me will go and be with the Lord. But that's not the way God created us. And that's not the way that we will be forevermore. We are made up of both body and spirit. We cannot be human if we are not physical and spiritual in our, our makeup, our physical makeup. And so in verse 14, God both raised up the Lord, did something seemingly impossible, and he will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot or a prostitute? Certainly not. Or, or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. There's the resurrection. The Lord Jesus is declared, it says in Romans chapter 1, verse 4, to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. And so God the Father raised up the Lord Jesus and he also will raise us up. All right? And so the power, the resurrection power that went behind the idea of raising Jesus up from the dead and raising us up and one future day uh, from the dead. What he's saying is believers should know that their physical bodies are, are united with Christ in this way. And he is the head of all things, even the church. And so when men in the church, the Corinthian church I'm talking about, when they were physically intimate with prostitutes or harlots here, they took what belonged to Christ and they gave it away to this idea of sinful activity. The human body is created by God and it is a good thing. And so Paul is going to tell us that it is the temple of God and the Holy Spirit chose to indwell our physical bodies. And so the body should not be indulged because it has no, you know, significance to God. You, you know, we're going to go ahead and give in to all of our desires because God doesn't care what we do in the physical realm. It's the spiritual realm that counts. There are people that are like that. Also, it shouldn't be viewed as some sort of a hindrance from getting to a higher spiritual plane so that we, we, we feel guilty about having physical urges or desires or needs. God made us that way, all right? But, but it's the sinful way in which we apply these things. That becomes important. The body is for the Lord and the Lord is for the body and he will raise our physical bodies just as he raised the physical body of Jesus, he says in the text. 
In other words, our bodies. God will save both the physical body and spirit of the believer. That's what makes us a person. We can't be people without both of those things, right? He is that powerful. And so I believe in the resurrection of the body, not the resurrection of the spirit, right? My spirit will leave my earthly body when I die, but my physical body will be put back together and it will be made like the resurrection body of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe in a real physical body that can be seen and touch and that can feel and see and hear. All of those things will be true when I have my resurrection body. And I will look very much the same as I look now. So the idea is real, okay? Not some ethereal, mist-like vapor, but I will be real, just without sin, and with this powerful resurrection body that Jesus made for me. I, I believe in that, and, and I believe in a real material heaven and earth that are to come. A new heaven and a new earth, literally, okay? Not some spiritualized idea, but, but a new heaven and a new earth. I believe that we're all going to dwell as God's people and we're going to be in those actual material places. And we will see and be with one another, with new bodies in the new creation. That's what I believe when, when the Bible says that we will reign with Christ within the kingdom of God. This is the human experience as God had intended it. And we're going over that on Sunday nights. So union with Christ is through the power of his res resurrection. We, we ought to flee sexual immorality and not embrace it. That's what he's telling us here. And, and we ought to do that because the bodies of all believers, he's telling us, individually are members of Christ himself. Now, he had already said that the church, all right, the church was the uh, dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Now, we too as individuals become the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. We are the temple of the Lord. One man put it this way, he said, the body of the believer is for the Lord because through Christ's resurrection, God has set in motion the reality of our own resurrection. And that's true. Sexual immorality is absolutely wrong. It's wrong morally, it's wrong ethically, and we need, we need to say that. We need to preach that. But, but that's not the real problem, right? It, it's not just the sin that's the problem. It's the fact that we have been duped by a worldview. That was true of the Corinthians. I think it's even true today. We've been duped into thinking that the physical body really doesn't count. And it has no value to the Lord. And so we give in to these things knowing full well that it is wrong. We are joined to Christ himself, he tells us, through his resurrection. He uh, is talking about his resurrection, our future resurrection too. Therefore, may it never be, as the King James puts it, God forbid, may it never be that we should take uh, away a part of the body of Christ, because we ourselves as individuals are part of the body of Christ, that we should take that away as an individual believer and make it a part, in this case, of the body of a prostitute. In our cases today, there are many areas in which sexual immorality find their vent. And so physical intimacy itself uh, is not the problem. We understand that, or at least we should. I guess there, there, there are still people who think that the, the physical act of intimacy, that that in and of itself is sinful. But it is not sinful. It is something that God created us to do within marriage. And so physical intimacy isn't the problem because the husband and wife and the physical intimacy that goes on in their union becomes a metaphor for Christ and his relationship to the church. We don't say that enough, but it's true. That's why he says the two shall become one flesh. And so that's not the problem. What is the problem is physical intimacy with the prostitute. And dig a little deeper than just the bald-faced sin. 
It's the believing man in the church at Corinth joining himself to a person who is not a member of the body of Christ. That's the problem, right? Participating in worldly activity, participating in worldly sin. This person, this prostitute, somebody to be pitied, somebody to have compassion on, somebody to lead uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ, but somebody not a member of the body of Christ, somebody who has a body that is bound for condemnation and not bound for resurrection. He who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with the Lord. Through that Holy Spirit, the believer's spirit, so you've got the Holy Spirit and the believer's spirit interacting here, you have this unitedness or this union with Christ and the idea is the believer can never be severed from him. We belong to him. We have become one spirit, capital S and small s, with Christ. Since this is true, then Christians should, like it says in verse 18, flee sexual immorality. And then here comes this verse that causes a lot of confusion. I, I think I had read somewhere this week that 20 to 30 different interpretations exist for this passage. But he says, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. It's not that sexual immorality is the only area in which we sin against our own body. We sin against our own body if we overeat, right? We sin against our own body if we don't get enough sleep, if we don't take care of ourselves. So those aren't the only areas where we sin against our own body, but in this context, Paul is talking about this particular area. And so when a believing man in Corinth commits sexual immorality by going to a prostitute, he sins against his own body by doing so. And the irony, Paul will say, is that his own body is not really his own. Right? I don't know, verse 18 uh, says that, he sins against his own body as if he possesses it, but it's not his own. Every other sin is outside the body or apart from the body in the sense that all the other sin that, that, that we commit is directed specifically towards one's body, not in a way that sexual immorality is. Because the metaphor is what's important. How we're defiling the temple. Um, how we're not using our body in a way that the Lord intended for us to use it. We're not His. We belong to someone else. And so, sexual immorality is directed against the body that should be for the Lord, he's saying. When a man from the Corinthian church went to a prostitute, he took his body and he made it a member of her body rather than for Christ. He didn't lose his salvation, but a believer's body needs to be the temple of the Holy Spirit at all times. It's purchased from the slave block uh, of sexual immorality. If we, It's sin overall, but, but for sexual immorality in this passage, by the Father. And, and it's done so with the blood of the Son. It's destined for resurrection. Therefore, the body must not be under the mastery of sexual immorality, the believer's body needs to be under the mastery of Christ. And so yes, your, your body is your own in one sense because God doesn't make us love him or even make us uh, choose right. God has given us this freedom, human responsibility, we believe in it. right? And, and ultimately, we know that our body belongs to God there are going to be times when we choose to use it for sin and we don't live in that awareness. We give in to sin. We are his unique possession, this text is telling us. We belong to him. Therefore, we have a body that is destined for eternal redemption, not for eternal corruption. And so we shouldn't be joined to that eternal corruption. And then he finishes by saying, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body 
and in your spirit, which are God's. It's interesting, back in chapter 3, we learn that uh, the Christian church is the temple of God. Now we're learning in chapter 3, verse 16, and then later he tells us in verse 17 that, that the church is a holy temple and it must not be defiled. Now we're learning the same thing about the individual. The individual is the temple, his body, her body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and it must not be defiled. And, and we belong to God. And so he's using that metaphor not just for the church, but for individual believers. And we make up the church. Each individual belongs to God. We belong to God body and spirit. Not just in a spiritual format, all right? But we belong to him body and spirit. Therefore, your body as it is right now, okay, that belongs to God. It's not just looking off into the future. And it's not your spirit that's going to be redeemed. It's your body that's going to be redeemed. Your spirit too. But the viewpoint here is look at the body because it matters. And so the death and the resurrection of Christ along with the present day work of the Holy Spirit, that is transforming us. And that extends not just to the inner man or the spiritual nature of who we are, but, but to the body as well. That's why, as we live our lives, we shouldn't be uh, dominated by certain sins of the body, especially in the areas of sexual immorality. And that means we flee sexual immorality. God has given us the power to do just that, whereas before we would have no power like that. This is why the Christian should never adore or abuse his, his own body. Instead, our bodies are honorable. We, we see them as that because... We recognize that God created us. That, that's what gives us honor. That's what exalts us, right? You are not your own. And so you can't do whatever you want to do with your body. It's not up to you, right? And in areas of sexual, sexuality, this is the problem. And this is where authority comes in. Sex is a, is a key way for people to express their identity. And so the bottom line of this passage uh, today relates to this idea of authority. And so you're here this morning and you fall into one of two groups. Uh, either you are of those who believe that they are independent and autonomous and they can run their own lives the way that they choose, or you believe, as Christians should, that you are created by God and you must depend upon God for wholeness, for honor, to be exalted, to reign with Him, to depend on Him, to realize that He will be all in all. Everything we do flows from either of those two identities. And when it comes to sexuality, especially in our day right now, we see this like never before. We see it so clearly. Will you be what God created you to be, or, or will you live as your own God with no higher purpose other than to do whatever it is that you want to do and to fulfill the lusts of the flesh, to satisfy your desires. See, our passage today overall is saying that if we're ever going to remain sexually pure, if we're ever going to be what we need to be in this present darkness, we need to understand our position in Christ. We need to understand that we are children of God. And other metaphors, like slaves of Christ, we need to understand this. Every other choice about sexuality and, and even the rest of our life flows from our position in Christ. Dependent children and slaves of Christ. And so we need to be who God created us to be. God created us to be servants, His servants. And, and everything is not permissible to servants, right? And so when we look at this text early on, everything is not permissible to us and, and everything is certainly not beneficial to us or, or even to the believers around us. And so we need to be careful with this phrase. Paul said that you must not be brought under the power of anything in this world, so everything can't be permissible to you. Now, if you're in Christ or if you're in the will of God, I can see that phrase making sense. Because you're not going to desire things that are sinful. And so at that point, everything will be permissible for you. Everything will be the will of God for you. 
But often that's not the way this phrase is being used. We are free from the bondage of our sinful cravings. We don't need to give in to them. We don't need to be dominated by them. But that freedom is not to do whatever else we want to do. That freedom is to do what God wants us to do. True freedom is found in that great paradox. It's found in our identity of being a bond slave of Jesus Christ. That's where you find freedom. And if the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. We take God's grace for granted as believers when we sin as much as we want to, especially in the areas of sexual immorality. And we don't even bother dealing with these uh, nasty sins that, that are dragging the world down to hell today. And I'm not just talking about uh, pornography, but a bunch of other things that relate to selfish thinking when it comes to sexual immorality. We are aware of the freedom that we have in Christ so then why do we keep choosing to live and, and to stoke our, our sinful natures? I have been crucified with Christ, uh, Paul said in Galatians 2.20. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We are dead in Christ, as servants of Christ. Uh, our sin issue is really a gospel issue, and that's what Paul has been writing all along in 1 Corinthians. We should walk in the newness of life by realizing that we are crucified in Christ. We are dead in Christ. That means that God's grace is always going to be there for us. It will rise up and, and it will give us strength that we need, that strength that is greater than our temptations and strength that is greater than our sin. This doesn't lead to presumptive living. Still, grace is freely given to me. And, and free from my perspective, but costing God a great deal. We've been bought with a price, the passage says. And that price, implicit here, is the price that Jesus paid. His blood shed for your sin, for my sin. So how can we continue to wallow in sin so that grace may abound? May that never be, as it says in Romans chapter 6. So we need to walk in the newness of life, in this present life. We need to be different. and We need to have victory over sin. Our walk must be in step with our identity as servants and as children and, and many other things that, that God has given to us in his word that, to encourage us that we belong to him. Will we present our bodies to God as slaves of righteousness and, and not slaves to sin? That's the question. If we will, then we'll, the newness of life will be there for us. And it, and it will produce the fruit of righteousness. The, the Holy Spirit will bear fruit in our lives and we will live a holy or a set-apart life and we will bring hope to this dying world. We are risen in Christ as well. The resurrection is linked in our passage because of the power that is there. That's what he says. So if God is going to resurrect my earthly body and make it like the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, he certainly has the power to give me victory over those sins that tend to dominate my life. And including those sins that are, are, are really pernicious, those sins of, of sexual immorality. Romans 6 and verse 5 says that we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Our passage today says that God shall raise us up by his power. So we are members of Christ. We're united in the likeness both of his death and his resurrection, the Bible teaches us. So let us live with Christ, all right? Considering these things to be true in our lives as we go throughout our week instead of living in defeat. Christ freed us from the penalty of sin, the moment that we were saved. Today, he continues to save us from the power of sin. What do we do with that resurrection power in our lives? Do we consider it so? Do we know that it's true? Because it is. You may even believe that it's not true, <laughs> but it's true. All right? You have to believe what the Word of God says, that Jesus has saved you from the power of sin so that you can live in this present life and not choose to sin. If you do sin, you have an advocate with the Father. We don't live in defeat. 
But the general trend of the Christian's life is spiritual maturity. That's the normal Christian life. And victory over sins. Not living in permanent defeat in sin. And so tomorrow morning, consider these things to be true of your life. Count on Christ's life at work in and through you. Live your week aware of the resurrection power that's been made available to you even now. Not just power to raise you from the dead, but power to transform your life so that you're conformed to the image of Christ. He gives us the ability to live to God as righteous in Him. As God is, so we are in the world, 1 John chapter 4. How is that possible? He gives us the ability to live righteous lives, rich, righteous lives in Christ. And so we appropriate that life, that life that Christ has won for us by grace through faith. The condition in which you live your life might get as sad as it did for the Corinthian men that are described here in the latter part of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, going into prostitutes, men in the church. And, and I'm not even dealing with the fact were these guys truly believers or not, because they can be. There have been believers that have gone into prostitutes and they have rationalized these sins away in many different uh, ways, but they have lived miserable lives. But, but living a miserable life doesn't alter the position that you have in your, in, in, in your relationship with Christ. But, but that position that you have in Christ, it can alter the miserable condition of your life. You don't need to live in permanent defeat when it comes to certain sins, especially in the area of sexual immorality. God can and God will deliver you on a daily basis. He will set you free indeed. You belong to God forever. Your body and your spirit will go on forever. You are one with Christ. You are his temple. You are his child. You are his servant. But you are not your own. You don't call the shots. You belong to God. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit because they belong to him. Let's pray to you. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for this passage of scripture and other passages like Romans 6 and Galatians 2 that teach us that we have freedom over the power of sin. And I pray, Lord, that uh, we would live lives like that it's so easy to forget what we have in Christ and to give in to that old sin nature. Help us to put off the sin nature this week and to put on Christ, to enjoy victory, to enjoy our fellowship with you. We love you so much, Lord. Help us to go in grace and peace. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, God bless you. We will see you this evening at 5 p.m. for our